Uh, my name is Earl Kreps. I direct the Doctor of Ministry program at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary here in Springfield. Uh, you just heard a presentation by some of our uh, staff and students, and we hope that that was a positive thing for you. Uh, I've been asked by the organizers of the conference today to talk with you for a few minutes about postmodern contexts in the university setting and what it means to be a Pentecostal person in ministry in that kind of context. So I've called this session Pentecostal Ministry in the Post-Secular uh, University. Now remember, we're piling up all of our questions until the end of the day, so no questions now because then civilization would break down and we'll have all kinds of trouble and I'll be in trouble and I'll, I'll never come back. But if you do have questions, we do have that panel discussion at the end of today, write them down and we'd love to have them from you at that point. Now if you have a cell phone, uh, I'd like you to take it out please and turn it on. Make sure it's on a uh, silent mode and pick someone and text them this question, what is postmodernism? Now, the reason we have you on a silent mode is because you might be texting somebody in this room, and so we don't want 50 phones going off all at the same time. But text them this question, what is postmodernism? And we're going to break at a couple of points to see if you get any answers back. We'd like to have you share those answers with us. There are two main sections to what we'll talk about today. Uh, we want to begin by taking a quick look at what is being called the post-secular university, and then look at Romans 15 and how it describes what it might mean to be in Pentecostal ministry in that context uh, or in any other context. Uh, our point is not going to be to try to tell you a list of how-to points because you have wonderful campus leadership that is much more expert in those things than I would ever be. What I want to try to do today is to help us come to a certain point of view on what it means to be in Pentecostal ministry in this very unique and incredibly strategic setting. Because it's my belief that if I've got the right perspective, I can figure out the practical stuff. But if I start with the practical stuff and it doesn't work in the first three months, I have nowhere to go. So we're going to be working on that perspective and drawing it uh, from the book of Romans today. Now, if our remote is uh, working, and I think it usually does, there we go. We'll talk about the post-secular university as the first section of this particular workshop. Uh, universities have been described in many, many ways. This is one of the latest terms that's being used to describe your school. Now, have any of you ever heard this term used on your campus? No one has? Now, I'm not surprised because it's actually only being used by expert people, sociologists and people who write about higher education, to talk about you behind your back. Now, everybody has a language they use to talk about others behind their back. Uh, you know, you might refer to your unbelieving roommate as lost at Chi Alpha, but would never use that word to their face. You know how that works? Well, this is how sociologists describe you. You are a post-secular university student. And that has a, a very specific kind of meaning. Uh, universities in the United States were originally largely founded out of religious purposes. You're all aware of the fact that Harvard University was created to train ministers. Much of the same could be said of Yale and a lot of the original sort of East Coast Atlantic seaboard schools. And over time, with the uh, advent of uh, increasing modernity and science, technology, uh, growing secularism, a sort of second phase of the university arrived in the 20th century. And in that century, universities now become the bastions of scientific rationalism. These are the places where the major research and development labs are located. These are the places where major new technologies are developed. These are the places where naive young Christian high school students go to lose their faith because they sit in their first biology class and hear their all-knowing professor describe evolution as a contradictory account of how creation takes place and knowing nothing more about creation than what's in the book of Genesis, their faith collapses under the onslaught of, of the scientific evidence and the fossil record and archaeology, which disproves the Old Testament accounts of biblical history and so forth and so on. Uh, Christians in the middle of the 20th century fear the secular university because this is where the liberals live. This is where the Democrats get their educations. This is where people who come out no longer believing that faith is really a viable alternative uh, are formed and shaped. If you will, the university of the 20th century is the seminary of secularism. 
It's where we learn the foolishness of the religious way of life. In fact, this idea was so powerful that it produced what was called the secularization hypothesis, which is the notion that religion in the United States would essentially be over by the end of the 20th century or a little bit thereafter. Major, big-time people in sociology bet their careers on that idea and turned out to be wrong. <laughs> Today, many of them publicly have recanted, writing books saying, oops, I kind of had that one wrong, but they all have tenure, so they're all still in their uh, position. I think we're in a third phase of university life today in which the straight-up secular approach has turned out to feel pretty hollow to people. Uh, if you have walked the streets of Europe, as I have, uh, not at great length, but briefly, and felt the impact of a post-Christian secular life on people and seen the despair and the emptiness and the way people turn to refuges like the club scene to try to add something to give their lives meaning, this kind of uh, sense that all a secular science is going to leave us is penicillin and no satisfaction uh, has led people to look for more. And so today, people who write about your life on campus are talking about your schools as being post-secular. In other words, we haven't shut down the hard science department or the business school because you may go back and get an MBA. But what's happening is the campus atmosphere, the curriculum, and in particular, the faculty and students are now increasingly spiritual people. And spirituality is being used as an antidote to the diseases that secularism brings. So for example, people would point at the advances brought by uh, science and rationalism and say, well, all that's great, but what about global warming? Or all that's great, but what about drug addiction? Uh, what about farm parties that high school and college kids are having now uh, with uh, prescription drugs now being the drug of choice and so forth and so on? And what about the fact that at the end of the day, all of this logic and all of this philosophy and all of this rationality leaves you with nothing? We need something more. And so while it would have been uh, fairly accurate to describe the 20th century university as the seminary of secularism, today, in a sense, they are almost seminaries of spirituality. Uh, survey after survey after survey is showing that college students are not only still fairly religious, but they are increasingly spiritual. And uh, as a result of that, we're in a whole different place than we were when I was in college back during the Civil War. Uh, the atmosphere is completely different. Uh, in my day, the issue was... Um, sort of Josh McDowell, straight up, you know, kind of authority of the Bible, evidences for the resurrection of Jesus. And that stuff is still very, very important. Today, I can explain all of the evidences for Jesus' resurrection to someone in a coffee house, and they'll say, whatever. It's a very different kind of climate, and this will be the climate that will be the mission field you'll be operating in for the remainder of your, your college career. Uh, let me give you kind of a couple of visual ways of understanding what's going on in this particular context. Has anybody gotten an answer to their question on what is postmodernism yet? It's too early to think about that, isn't it? There will probably be some towards the end. Uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to define uh, what is post-secularism, what is postmodernism, uh, what do these words mean, thinking that if I could get a definition that that would somehow help us to do mission on campus and in other places. But ultimately, I didn't come to a definition. I came to uh, a picture. And uh, I think people think visually. Uh, and the picture I came to is the picture of the, the black hole. Pretty, pretty black up there, isn't it? If you're a science major, you know that a black hole is a point of infinite gravity in the universe, which means it is a gravity well where the forces of gravitation are so strong that even light itself cannot escape. And so, in a sense, it's a gravity implosion where these forces become so overwhelmingly powerful that if any object or any other force, even light uh, or electromagnetism, comes close to a black hole, these powerful gravitational forces will suck it in to this point of in infinite density, this singularity at which the laws of physics no longer operate. No one knows what happens at the singularity. It's impossible to say because no one's ever been there, of course, and been able to survive. 
I began to think that this might not be too bad a picture of what it means to live in a postmodern, post-secular kind of context. And by that, I mean this. If we changed our lens a little bit and looked at black holes this way, and up at the top you have the weakest gravity, it gets more intense as this shape funnels down to this point of infinite density, and then some people believe that this is actually the entryway to a wormhole, for all of you Star Trek fans. And they sort of get, like it's a big giant toilet, and you get flushed out the bottom, and you go into this alternative universe where everyone looks like Prince, or something like that. <laughs> uh, and that's basically what a black hole, that's my hope anyway, that everyone looks like Prince in this alternative universe. So you might think of this postmodern context in, in the, these kinds of terms. At this point of infinite density, at the narrowest point in the funnel, where the gravity, so to speak, is the most intense, is the idea that nothing can be known. I mean, utterly, absolutely, nothing can be known. So you might condense that or summarize it by saying, at the point of infinite density is the word no. Can anything be known? No. Can anything be communicated? No. Can anyone be trusted? No. Can any other human be known? No. There's even some literature in psychotherapy that says you as a person, as a self, don't even exist, which makes me wonder why they charge me $90 an hour. But do, do I have existence? Am I a self? No. This is what you might call hardcore philosophical postmodernism, which says that our ability to know the universe around us is completely fiction. And what we're doing is simply constructing a movie of reality in our own minds. You're simply a movie producer arranging the perceptions around you in a way that suits you based on your culture, your race, your identity. Uh, if you've ever tried to communicate with your roommate effectively, you know how close to the truth this can be on some days. Uh, people see things in completely different ways and consequently, uh, at this point of infinite density, uh, and for the people who live there culturally, uh, the world is a very bleak, dark place in which it's impossible to know anything or anyone in absolute terms. Uh, this type of postmodernism uh, is the very hardcore variety. I'll speculate that there aren't quite as many people there as there are at some of the other places, but there are people who live there. Maybe your philosophy professor or your English literature professor. Now, about halfway out, so to speak, on the funnel, where the gravity is less because you're farther away from the singularity, uh, there's a sort of second area of kind of not absolute no, but moderate suspicion of everything. Uh, writers on this talk about uh, a hermeneutic of doubt. Now, maybe the hardcore person is sitting next to you in English literature class, and they're like, nothing exists. I'm going to wear a black crew cut and a black T-shirt because nothing can be known, and we need to deconstruct because deconstruction and justice is all that remains. And, and they're sort of a crusader for uh, utter epistemological... Uh, nothingness. Well, the person on the other side of you in English literature class looks at that and says, that's stupid, man. <laughs> of course we need to put down the man. He's evil. The man wants me to have a Blackberry so I can never take a vacation without checking my email. You know, the man wants me to take this test and go through this university because it shapes me into a homogenous consumer so it's easier for the man to sell me goods and services. The whole point of universities is to shape generational cohorts, making it easier for Madison Avenue to figure out our traits and mass produce or mass customize, whichever you prefer, products and services that we will consume like pigs with our snouts in the trough. But hold off, dude. What do you mean nothing can be known? So when I see the stop sign at the intersection on my way to the drive through coffee place, it's not really there, and I can just sail through it 90 miles an hour if I want to? Well, this second student on the other side of you in English class says, I, I just can't go there. It's just not practical. You know, I, I know there's some problems. I know powerful people are all evil until I become one. And I... I I know that, that, you know, language is vague and arbitrary. I get all that. But the truth of the matter is if I have an infection, I have to trust that the scientific method has produced a penicillin shot that works. And so this person's sort of in the middle. They're not into the philosophical side. They have the cynicism down pat. In fact, they've raised that to an art form. But they still want all the benefits of modernity, especially those produced by science and technology in the latest MP3 player. Now, out at the far edge, 
are people who I would call postmodern in look and feel, to use the Zanga terminology, only. In other words, they look at Mr. Hardcore Black T-shirt and say, dude, get a job. I mean, you've got to be kidding. Nothing can be known, yada, yada. Like, you're never going to date a girl because you can't really be sure she's there. Right-o. <laughs> and, they, and, and they look at the cynic, who is not a philosopher, and, and say, you know, th th lighten up. You know, you're no fun at parties. You're always going on and on about the men and free trade and globalization and global warming. You have all those bumper stickers on the back of your used Volvo. You know, just no fun at all. This person just looks at the English literature professor and says, cool glasses. Got to have those. Gets right down to iMart and finds the glasses. This is where you, the only place you can find postmodern glasses in Springfield. In the bottom drawer at the back, takes them out, puts them on, buys them, calls his friend on the cell and says, dude, I am postmodern. Now, this is the wannabe person who's at the edge of the gravitational field. And the truth is, this entire black hole exists on your campus. And people move up and down the funnel depending on the issue we're talking about. If it's lunch, we might be up at look and feel. If it's who to vote for, we might be in the middle. If it's the nature of the universe, we might be at the bottom of the well and then back out to the edge when it comes for dinner. But your campus lives in the grip of this gravitational field. And everyone you meet is positioned somewhere in it. Now, here's a thought experiment that you could do. What if repentance is being dragged down the funnel and forced out the other side? Out of darkness into marvelous light. Now, what that might mean is that the person in your English Lit class who looks like they're the most hopeless, the most lost, and who wears the stinky black T-shirt every single day may actually be the closest to the kingdom of God. Who did Jesus go to? Did he come to evangelize the religious people? No. He found the woman caught in adultery and said to the self-righteous, you boys go ahead and throw the first stone if you've got no sin. And then told, tells her, you're forgiven, go and sin no more. So when you see that individual that seems most in the grip, you're probably seeing the individual that the Spirit is dealing with most powerfully. And this is the premise of everything we're going to say today. That is the foundation of Pentecostal ministry on the post-secular campus. Because the Spirit is always most active at the margins. The Spirit's most active with people who hurt, people who are in the grip, people who can't shake the darkness off themselves, and that's where we need to be. If we want to stay at the big part of the funnel where it's easy and just play religious games to shuffle kids out of inner varsity and into our group, we should shut down. If this is just a culture war to see who can have the coolest worship band, you know, who can have the lead singer with the haircut like the Goo Goo Dolls guy or whatever, if that's all this is, we will never have a spirit ministry on that campus because the spirit is operative among the hurting and the lost, people who are cut off from God. And I believe what he wants to do is not make bad people good. He wants to make dead people live. He wants to pull them down the wormhole and out the other side uh, into the kingdom of God. Let's talk for a few minutes about what that might look like. We'll uh, skip over a few slides here that I think we've already touched on. And talk for a, a couple of minutes about the nature of this sort of Pentecostal ministry. Um, have any of you seen the uh, Robert Duvall film, The Apostle? Have you seen that? Wow, it's an awesome film. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, uh, I, I strongly advise that you take a look at it. It's one of the only films that I have seen that gives a respectful treatment to Pentecostals at all, and particularly to Pentecostal ministry. Duval plays a traveling evangelist in the South uh, in the movie, and it's basically the story of his rise and fall uh, as he deals with a, a lot of uh, issues in his own life. And uh, what is uh, gripping about this film 
is that uh, his portrayal of, it, of the evangelist is actually drawn from time he spent over many, many months with Pentecostal ministers. In other words, he didn't read a book and then try to imitate us or watch two TV broadcasts and try to do a sort of caricature. He attempted to draw it from their own lives. And uh, when you see the film, or perhaps when you've been in a Pentecostal church, uh, well, let me explain it this way. The last two preset buttons on my car radio are radically different. The last button, number five, is a local Christian radio channel that carries 24 hours a day the voice of a well-known radio evangelist from the Deep South. Constantly, every minute, every hour, his voice, his singing, his fundraising. The next button, number four, is classic rock and roll. It's the Rolling Stones, it's David Bowie, it's even some early U2, if you can believe that, been around that long. And this morning as I'm driving in, I'm going back and forth between these two buttons. Amazing grace. Simply irresistible. <laughs> back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And they're just that far apart, an eighth of an inch, back and forth. And I'm thinking to myself, driving in here to meet with you, do these two things have any possible way of connecting? This is the sort of Sunday night, uh, gray suit, hair gel, afterglow, altar call, laying on hands, big white hanky, filled pause, gasping, gulping, preaching, four-part harmony, Gaither video type experience. Have any connection to the ecstasy, club-based, oxy, uh, David Bowie, Rolling Stones, insane clown posse, nine-inch nails, Marilyn Manson, hip-hop, P. Diddy thing. I mean, I mean it's, isn't it, is it any wonder that people stood out here and said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, this Channel 5, really. I mean, what, what, what is it with those people? I mean, I mean, look at them. We have no analog for that. We have no, we have no bridge, no way of understanding them. I mean, it's so southern and so rural. And so, you know, trailer parky. And so, you know, why do you have to talk like that? And the, and the, you know, the running around and the snapping, the hanky and the yelling and the screaming and all the, the sin and death and evil and wrong and thou shall not. And over here, uh, I think the people on Channel 5 would look over at Channel 4 and say, unclean, don't want to touch you. Uh, you know, you're cu you've got the dust of Egypt all over you. You're, you're living like the prodigal son before he came home with his face down in the pig slop. And the music, my goodness, it's right from the pit of hell. And so I go back and forth between four and five, and I ask myself, how in the world are we going to connect these two worlds? In a post-secular context, which would you agree with me, tends to side with Channel 4. And the Robert Duvall film gives me the same question. When you see his character, you think, this is a voice from the 19th century. I want to suggest to you this morning that the issue is not how to connect Channel 5 and Channel 4. Uh, the issue is creating Channel 4 and a half, which is a voice of Pentecostal ministry, which is, as a friend of mine put it to me just a couple of days ago, is not in the closet, but isn't crazy either. Does that make sense to you? Which is out there and being experienced, which is unapologetic and is unrepentantly experiential, but is not maniacal or extreme uh, either. And I want to, uh, from Romans chapter 15, try to give you, I think, some anchor points for what type of thinking about Pentecostalism it might take to create that sort of experience. Now, I, I visit non-traditional Pentecostal ministries all over the country as part of my job, and I think it's safe to say that everybody I know who's getting it right is thinking in, in this sort of way. They're not identical. They're all very different, 
but they're all thinking in a certain way, and I think we can find that represented uh, in Romans chapter 15. A campus pastor from this particular organization that you all represent said this to me in a telephone interview uh, not too long ago. Well, my definition of Pentecostalism has been, I guess, changing over maybe the last year. I think especially in our context of ministry, which is full-on postmodernism, it's just being spirit-led. Pentecostalism to me today is being in the marketplace and being spirit-led in the marketplace. Getting a word of knowledge isn't just for Bessie Lou at the altar, but it's for John at Starbucks. If our faith doesn't work at Starbucks, it doesn't work at all. How do we escape the Channel 5 paradigm, which is obviously culturally bound up in a lot of ways, to forge a Pentecostal experience that might work at Starbucks or at Hot Shots if you prefer their drive through coffee? From Romans 15, I want to make a few suggestions to you for your consideration. Uh, and the first of those is a very simple principle about the operations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. More is good. More is good. Uh, in Romans 15, 13, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, among Pentecostal people that I know, I sometimes don't encounter hunger for more of God. Now, I know that's an old school way of talking about our way of doing Christianity. But in, in these verses where I see Paul praying for this to happen to the Roman church, if he's praying for it, I've got to believe that it's something that we need to value and that God is willing to pour out on us. And so uh, people sometimes will talk to me and say, well, you know, I don't know about spirit baptism and evidences and all this stuff and I have all these questions. And one of the ways you can resolve all of that is to simply ask yourself, is more good? And I believe that it is. Because I don't think that God, who is the giver of every good and perfect gift, uh, who is not going to give us a, a stone if we asked for uh, a loaf of bread or an egg or any of those things that Jesus talked about, wants to pour more of the Spirit's power, his life, his energy, his gifts, and his graces uh, into us. And he's going to do that for a people who believe that God could do more than our current experience and who are hungry to see that happen. I want to suggest that you have to have that hunger on your campus. That you have to have a longing to see God break through in a post-secular climate and do above and beyond what you can ask or even think. That although our plans and our strategies are important, it's vital to have excellence in everything that we do. We have to execute our plans with a very high level of proficiency. We have to have quality in everything. At the end of the day, I've got to be trusting God to move in a way that I've never seen before. Would you agree with me? I hope that none of you are content this coming semester with what you saw last semester. I hope if you have a group of, of, of 40 and you are calling success a group of 50, that you will surrender that goal. And you'll go back to God and say, God, I am hungry for you. I want you to do more in me. I want you to pour out your spirit. I want you to blow this campus away. I want you to break this bad boy wide open. And I don't care what the English literature professor says about us. We need a shamelessness. Now, notice that's not the same as being a weirdo. Are, are you hearing me? I'm not talking about being a, you know, being a nut job on your campus. I'm talking about a disposition of our heart. It's an internal attitude that says, Lord, we have not seen everything that you want to do here. We want to see more, bigger, better. We want you to do incredible stuff. We want you to baptize hundreds of people in the Holy Spirit, not dozens. We want to see you move in strength. Because I'll tell you, at our current rate of, uh, of mission expansion, we're losing. We are not getting the job done. Lots of great people are working hard, and this is just as true in church as it is in any kind of parachurch organization we have got to have more from god and that's going to mean the power of the holy spirit uh, attempting to substitute methods or music styles or anything else uh, will only lead us back to a place of frustration and when i hear paul's heart here i believe that we need to to uh, to resonate with that 
more is good. It's always good in every way, every day, more is good. The second thing that's important to me from this passage is that Pentecostalism is a potential, not a warranty. Uh, Romans 15, 14 and 15 says, Paul speaking of himself, he says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I've written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me. Now, in this passage, he says, here are all these wonderful attributes that you guys in the church at Rome have, but I'm needing to write you to remind you about some things, too. In other words, the presence of those attributes isn't Kevlar. It doesn't make the people in the Roman church bulletproof against the slings and arrows of life that are going to come against them. Many, many times I've had the conversation with people that says, if being a Pentecostal is really what you guys claim it is, why do you have all the problems you have? Why do you have wacky televangelists? Why do you have moral failure? Why do you have uh, people who are carnal and fleshly in their attitudes in the parking lot, and then they're speaking in tongues in church? In other words, uh, it seems to me that the package of goods you claim attaches to spirit baptism doesn't really deliver in the real world when we really scrutinize the behavior of people who say that they have had that experience. And I, I think I back up to this particular remark by, uh, by the Apostle Paul uh, and, and can reflect on that and say that spirit baptism is only one part of a much larger mix. In other words, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in other tongues and you have bad breath, you're still not doing any evangelism. It's not meant to be a substitute for character, for planning, for wisdom, for direction, for holiness, for accountability, for common sense, and for not driving through the stop sign because your postmodern professor says it might not really be there. I've met a lot of people who are disappointed because they feel that once they became a Pentecostal person, everything should change and stay on automatic pilot, and that's just not how it works. Being filled with the Spirit is a tide that raises all of the other boats, but you've got to have the other boats in the water too. If we build an experience-based ministry only, we will ultimately fail because the rest of the stuff that needs to be in the mix of campus ministry just won't be there. The third thing I think that, that's key for me out of this particular passage is that a Pentecostal ministry needs to be about mission rather than about maintenance. Paul says of himself to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying there is, my calling, even though he begins as what he describes a as a, a Jew among Jews, a Pharisee among Pharisees, is to be a missionary to Gentiles in the Mediterranean basin, uh, in the provinces of the Roman Empire. Unthinkable for a person who comes from his starting point. Uh, I've had conversations on a, a number of times with people in leadership in the movement who have said, uh, what do I need to do to get my people interested in being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? Uh, how can we develop that? Or what sort of environment should we have for uh, praying with them? And the truth is there are 10 or 12 different environments that people are using around the country. But what's more true is that if this group of people, if your campus ministry is on mission on your campus, you will become so desperate that you'll do anything to get the power of the Holy Spirit operating in your lives. The way to get people interested in being filled with the Holy Spirit is to do something so dangerous that it becomes necessary. Most ministries are so safe, the Spirit doesn't need to clock in. You can do the songs. You can find the geek to run the projector. You can have a sociology major do the website for you. But if your heart is really to break through and reach your campus, to see the people who are at the singularity pulled through to the other side, it's going to put you on your face because you're going to confront abject catastrophic failure. And that kind of desperation out of that missionary heart 
is magnetic for the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm asked sometimes, you know, if being a Pentecostal is such a good thing, why are some of these big evangelical churches reaching people so much more effectively than the typical small Pentecostal congregation? I mean, if we speak in tongues, shouldn't we be winning everybody over, is what they're actually trying to say. And, I, you know, I think what is really happening there is the Spirit of God is drawn to people who are on mission, not to people who sign off on the right doctrinal statement. If your heart is to reach lost people, the Holy Spirit is your friend. Because <laughs> the Father's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I think what's missing among, among many Spirit-filled people is not only the hunger and the belief that more is good, but the belief that we need to get into the harvest field ourselves, get out beyond our own strength, so our only alternative is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and that that would be an enormous magnet to attract an outpouring into the group and into the campus itself. The fourth issue from uh, Romans 15 is that of Jesus being the center rather than the church itself. Paul talks in verse 17, saying, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus uh, in my service to God. Jesus does not come to operate in support of the Spirit's ministry. It's the other way around. Uh, I, I have met people that are almost, and I say this with respect, they're almost Pentecostal for its own sake. Uh, I, I've met people that almost are more interested in evangelizing for Pentecostal experience than they are evangelizing for the gospel. Most of their apologetic time is actually spent arguing with Reformed Christians about whether or not the gifts have passed away. Boy, there's a productive discussion, huh? Lost people are just going to flood to that debate. That's, that's brilliant. That's what we should be doing. The Spirit operates to exalt Christ, to bring Christ back to our mind, and to empower the church to work with Jesus in mission. Uh, one of the veins of our movement is that we can forget that Christ is the point of the whole thing, that he's the center, that he's the one who uh, has lived and taught the truth that the Spirit is going to bring back to the church and empower the church to live out and to bring to people who are anywhere in that gravitational well that's on your campus. A Christ-exalting ministry is going to be a ministry that the Spirit of God is attracted to in power. And the truth is, if Christ is lifted up in your ministry, the chances of things getting wacky correspondingly decrease. And the reason is, you're not worshiping spirit phenomena. You're lifting up the person of Jesus. And if Christ is in very high profile, if everything you do is revealing Jesus, then if there's an utterance in tongues in your meetings, your campus pastor can simply stand up and explain it. And you just go right on. And, you know, as a, a, one of your own leaders said to me the, uh, uh, last year, said, you know, if a, a person on one of these campuses uh, hears an individual uh, give an utterance in tongues, uh, their response will be, do that again. Because in this post-secular environment, people aren't put off by spiritual phenomenon as long as they feel safe, that nobody's going to drag out the poison Kool-Aid Say, well, it's grape tonight. We're all going to die and go to heaven. You know, or say, well, the UFOs are coming later, so let's all kill ourselves. You know, as long as that stuff isn't happening and you're explaining, uh, what people sense is there's something bigger than the phenomenon that just happened here. So if you have a prayer time and someone loses their strength and falls to the carpet, in a context where we're worshiping the phenomenon, that's weird and spooky and manipulative and strange and funky and but if Christ is the centerpiece then that phenomenon becomes the margin and not the center too often we've lost the handle on this issue and we've made the phenomenon the center and that does run people off the fifth thing that uh, we can bring from this chapter is that uh, this Pentecostal ministry is about power and not about identity. Uh, Paul writes in 18 and 19 of Romans 15, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit, 
So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Now, he's talking about his entire career as a missionary and essentially saying two things. One is, God sent me to the Gentiles. God sent me to the people at the singularity. God sent me to the people in the heart of darkness who were closest to the no. And this happens beginning at the road to Damascus, and his whole career is aimed down the wormhole to go after those people. And the second thing he's saying is, there's only one thing that made that happen, and that is God showed up in power and did stuff. And a great deal of the book of Acts is devoted to describing some of those things. People raised from the dead, people healed, uh, the demon-possessed woman in Ephesus being set free, uh, and all kinds of other things that took place. This is straight up old school power ministry. Uh, when Pentecostals start thinking that spirit experiences exist so that we can issue you a membership card as being part of the fraternity, we have lost it. In other words, that we pray for the sick, we speak in tongues, and all of these things so that we can sort of check the box that says, I am now officially in the Pentecostal club. Uh, there are people who think that way and who put a lot of pressure uh, on young people to have certain spiritual experiences so that they can know they're authentically in, that they're, that, that they're part of us. Now, now think of this. Jesus dies, stays in the tomb for three days. He's raised from the dead, teaches the church about the kingdom of God for 40 days, then ascends to heaven and uh, leaves the message that he is returning very, very soon, and he does all of that so I can speak in tongues. You know, when you think of it that way, it's absurd, isn't it? The point of spirit experience is not my denominational identity. Those phenomena accompany being filled with the Spirit, but the purpose of them has never been to establish that I'm in and out of a certain group. The point, Jesus said himself, was that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're going to receive power in that experience, and that power is going to fill us and enable us to do the same kinds of things at a post-secular university that the Apostle Paul did among the Gentiles. Now, you might think there's no way, you know, there's no way I'm going to ever be able to do that. I'm just a freshman French major at Kansas State. Jesus seems to love to use the most unlikely people. You know, it's the people who think they're capable that scare me a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Because they're the ones that tend to get into the things that freak everybody out. It's the people who, to whom the whole thing is a surprise. People like Paul, who got blasted on the road to Damascus and goes into this incredible powerful ministry among the least likely people in the world. That's you, man. That's you. That's every one of you. God wants to grip your heart and fill you with power. You have demon-possessed people on your campus that need to be set free. Did you know that? You have demonized people on your campus that need to have the powers of hell broken off them. You have people on your campus that are looking for freedom by riding down the wormhole, but the truth is they are so addicted they are in the grip of stuff, everything from farm drugs all the way out to internet pornography and stuff that we wouldn't even want to name in this place. And there is nothing and no one who is ever going to set them free but the person of Jesus Christ himself. He's the only one who's going to break those chains off of them. And that's going to mean people filled with the Spirit of God who believe that what Jesus did in his earthly ministry he still does, and it is the presence of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of that. And without that kind of power ministry, we are not going to win a war of words on a post-secular university. One final point. We are meant for the edge, not for the center. In verses 20 through 24, Paul says that it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Well, welcome to the post-secular university where Christ is not known. Christ is not known you. So that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Do you feel a little lonely in your Chi Alpha group on your campus? 
maybe you're just pioneering, you're just starting out, you've just got a handful of students and you're kind of ramping everything up, or maybe you've been around for a while, but you've got, you know, 50,000 post-secular pagans surrounding you, and on Thursday night, you've, you've only got 30 or 40 people out, and you feel like this little pinprick on the side of this giant elephant. And how are we ever going to move this? That is the situation Jesus loves. Paul said, it's the best job in the world. I don't want to go where there's 59 other campus groups and every other kid was grew up in the deacon's household at the Baptist church around the corner. No way, man. I want to go someplace where no one's ever been and let's throw down. Let's find out whose God is God. Let's see if there's anything to this. Let's see the power of God come and do stuff that you can't explain with sociology. Let's try it with a bad band and see what happens. See, that's the heart, and that heart is the greatness of this movement. When we get in trouble is when we want to build on something else. When we want to take someone else's Christianity and put it on turbo. Jesus has not sent us to make good Baptists into good Pentecostals. Jesus has sent us to reach into the darkest part of the gravity well, find people there, and pray them through from darkness into marvelous light. Somebody give me a witness in here on that. Paul says in verse 21, Rather it is written, those who are not told about him will see. Just put the name of your campus right in there. And those who have not heard will understand. Put the name of your campus right in there. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. In other words, I'm so busy reaching lost people, I can't get to meet the saved people. (laughs) That's great. I just have to love this. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, you know, we pretty much won everybody here at school. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to go to Europe now and start there. And since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to go to, to do so when I go to Spain. That was the home of the barbarians. Nobody wanted to go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. In other words, I'll hang with the Christians once we've reached everybody else. And when we run out of post-secular pagans on this campus, we'll move down the street. That attitude and that attitude alone is going to bring the kind of anointing we're going to need in a post-secular campus. And I think without that, what will happen is your group runs the risk of becoming a caricature of Pentecostal ministry rather than the real deal. The caricature is about superficial things. The caricature is about phenomena. The caricature is about extremes. It's about experience. The real deal is about heart and passion and mission and fire and power and deliverance and freedom in the name of Jesus. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And the Spirit's presence in you is the present tense guarantee that that is still the case. Let's pray. Father, in the strong name of Jesus... Lord, I lift up to you every student, every campus missionary that's in this room. And God, we are here in this conference at this time because we do believe that more is good. We do believe, Lord, we are hungry in our hearts for you to do more. There's no one here who's satisfied with what we saw last semester. But we're asking, God, that you would come now. Lord, I'm asking you to come in this moment. And as hearts reach out to you in faith, that you would fill every person in this room with your spirit. Full, as Paul said, to overflowing. Lord, I'm asking you now to come and administer your graces. God, that uh, people in this room would begin to experience the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Uh, People in this room, I think some of you are experiencing a, a, a sensation of warmness in your hands that people in this room who are, who are sensing these kind of phenomena would, would be able to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. Lord, that there would be supernatural discernment. There would be prophetic edge. 
to what we're doing on our campuses, not born out of a, a, a desire to mimic some kind of experience, Lord, but born out of an internal overflowing, a flowing of the river of your spirit within us. Lord, we are welcoming you to come right now and throughout this week, God, and to fill us with everything, every good and perfect gift that we need to be filled with so that we return to our campuses with a supernatural ministry of power that is inexplicable and that draws people to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We pray in your wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Listen, just as you go, um, I want you to be expecting this week that the Spirit of God is going to be releasing new graces in your life, that you're not here for knowledge or information transfer, but that as you walk out through this week, that you're going to experience new gifts from the Holy Spirit, uh, new powers, uh, new discernment. And I want to encourage you to begin to step out into those things. In other words, to act on them. To, uh, Mike Brake said it beautifully yesterday. It's like practicing working a muscle. Step into that stuff. Get ready for returning to your campus uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, expect dreams in the night. Uh, expect prophetic revelations. Uh, expect uh, God to speak to you in ways, and the way you'll know it, it's that it's the real deal is that it's always to bless other people, always to encourage other people, and always to lift up Jesus. If you have an experience that you're not sure about, find your campus pastor or one of the staff members here and uh, reflect on it with them, and, and they can help you refine that discernment and uh, that ability to step out into these gifts. But don't don't leave this place or this conference just with a notebook full of stuff. Do you, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, we've just asked God to do this. I believe he has. And now when it begins to happen, you just step out into it. And uh, God's going to move, I think, in some strong ways. Bless you guys. It's been a privilege to be with you today. And uh, hope the rest of your day is full of uh, joy and good coffee.